everybody to On the Road with Auntie Nam, and today I am staying with the one, the only, the incredible, the amazing, I've written two whole blog posts about him, Psycho Dish. Yo! So we are actually in his kitchen recording a podcast where I'm drinking some whiskey because it's the only way I could stand the heat in this place without committing seppuku. It's pretty fr- freaking hot. That's okay, you can swear. We're... We are a uh, mature-centric channel. All right, that's pretty fucking hot. All right, so I figured as long as I'm here, we would uh, record a show or two. Yeah, all right. And this one, the uh, the topic of this one is going to be you. Because, you know, basically, I don't have a plan for podcasting. We're just setting it up and doing it. There's, there's no script or anything like that. So this is going to be a little while of just audio shitposting. Sounds good. So let's start with you. Now, you have a uh, colorful family history, shall we say. Yeah. Um, I'm about as blue-blooded a left-wing radical as you're going to find. I'm not alone in this. But pretty much since my family left England and Holland in the 1600s, and came across the ocean. We've been rabble-rousing and troublemaking and fighting the good fight. So, let's see, 1,600, that's four, 500 years of this. But you have actually turned fairly, at, at, I would describe you at least as a pretty solid Republican-ish voter at this point. Yes, yes, because it turns out that as I grow older and I watch what my family claims are the injustices, the horrors of the world, um, a lot of them can be fixed by, shocker, good old Christianity. <laughs> but that didn't stop you from having kind of a radical background. Actually, you know, let's go, let's go back, let's go back, let's go back. So your grandfather, great-grandfather, Wells? My grandfather, Wells, was a uh, drunk and chemical engineer in about that order. My grandma, Genius, very smart. Extremely smart. The only reason he didn't get rich on his puffed and dried fruit idea is that he got stuck on the idea of oil. He insisted that it had to be done with oil. And if you go look in the patent office, you'll see that later engineers scratched their heads and went, microwave. We can do this with a microwave. And so the current process is for doing what he invented involve a microwave, because it actually turns out to be a better way to do it. But he died a drunk and died swearing that he was going to solve the oil problem when there were better solutions around. Now, he was the type, he once told me that, you know, essentially he could have, like, a contract for a million dollars in one hand and a bottle of whiskey in the other hand, and in the morning he'd wake up with the bottle of whiskey empty and the contract not signed. Well, yeah, the whiskey's more important. What he wanted out of life more than anything was someone to give him a place where he could tinker with his machines, a woman who wouldn't give him too much trouble about the fact that he never gets a freaking thing done, and enough cigarettes and whiskey to keep him happy. Now, a woman who won't give you too much trouble, that's not exactly how I'd describe Catherine. No. Now, she's, <laughs> she's trouble... She's the definition of trouble. She took our centuries-long history of believing in fighting the good fight for the common man uh, and devoted her life to doing it. She was not Christian, but a lot of what she fought for was Methodist, was, in fact, Protestant Christianity. Um, But she was trouble for area politicians, trouble for the state legislature and the governor of California, um, particular trouble for a real estate developer that wanted to build on Albany Hill. She ultimately lost that fight, but as long as she was able to fight, she frustrated that real estate developer, and he could not build on Albany Hill until she stopped fighting. So she was, wasn't she, a card-carrying member of the Communist Party? No, Wells was. Wells was. Oh, okay. Yes. So is that how they met? That's a... I don't know, but that's a good story. I like it. So there seems to be a pattern to your family history where one generation will be total hellions, the next generation will try and be respectable and normal, 
The next generation will be total Hellions. The next generation will try and be respectable and normal. Yeah, well, if you're an adult child of an alcoholic, the thing you swear you never want to be is an alcoholic. You, you I don't ever want to be like my dad. Or, um, not that he's an alcoholic. No, my dad is not an alcoholic. And though we're drinking, I, I'm not, I'm, I am not an alcoholic either. Um, my grandfather, however... So, what were, what were some of Catherine's um, social causes during her time? She was a constant source of annoyance for the Albany City Council. There is a election for mayor and city council where she overturned the entire city government. She got the mayor out, and she got the entire city council out, and elected her slate. But she had been like a freedom writer. She had... Right, no, she... This is where it's interesting. It, her way of participating in civil rights was not to go and join the protest march. It, it was to go find a small town in Mississippi where she thought these people need something to do. They need a craft. They need a trade. They need something they can do for themselves. So being an artist, she thought if they knew how to make crafts, if they could make toys or woodcrafts or something... They could sell these. They could do an art co-op and be self-sufficient. So she went there and she spent several years on her own dime living in a small town in Mississippi, starting and, and running and, and trying to teach these people how to run an art co-op where people would make their own local crafts and sell them and, and earn a living. And that was her answer to the civil rights movement is these people needed to be... And it's kind of funny. This this socialist or communist woman is down there promoting in the streets, local, as local as you can get, capitalism. So what else did she do as sort of, you know, before she moved to Albany and planted herself? I don't know. <laughs> and you probably don't want to ask. Probably. Now, I remember her. I met her, I think, twice before she passed on. And I remember her having these huge file cabinets full of newspaper clippings and all kinds of stuff like that. What, what exactly was she doing there? She maintained, well, she curated a collection of archives of newspaper clippings and articles and materials the Albany Historical Society. Um, history was incredibly important to her. She felt like we had to know our history. We had to know where we had been so that we could have a better future. Now, for those of you who don't know, we're talking about Albany, California, which is just yes. north of Berkeley. Yes. We're not talking about Albany, New York here. No. So she and Wells got divorced at some point? Ah, the famous marriage ending fight um those two had been going back and forth for about a month about various things that married people fight about dishes where do the dishes go um if you're married you've had some of these stupid fights you put salt in the chicken well you don't put enough salt in the chicken and so on well so this had been going on for a month and Wells had had enough. And so his resolution to the thing was, as dinner was placed on the table and the children were seated and it was time to thank the food, he stood up, walked out the door, got in his Mustang, drove to Berkeley, didn't come back. So did, how did Catherine end up in the Berkeley area? She and Wells had bought that house in, at 8. 43 Washington Avenue. It's owned by another family now. When they got married. And that was the house that my dad was raised in. It's the house that she died in. Um, it is where all those papers were. In the in he left in the forties, fifties, early late forties, early fifties. And it's actually still true today. When this got before a judge and the question of division of property came up. She was a poor single mother with three kids, and he was a son-of-a-bitch bastard abandoning husband. So who's going to get the house was kind of a done issue. 
And she went from being a poor single mother to being a landowner with a mortgage, but still she owned the mortgage and the, and the house. And the house, she eventually paid for the house. And from then on, she set herself to local politics. Yes. Making a royal pest out of herself any place the city of Albany did business. Pretty much. So then we get to your dad, who is number what in the line? He's firstborn. Firstborn, okay. And he decides he's going to go in a totally different direction. Yes, because mom and dad are annoying as hell. So he goes to college, becomes an engineer. Yes. Ends up working for a contractor to the Navy and is at least somewhat responsible for the Aegis missile system. Right, so he puts himself through UC Berkeley in the 50s when there was this monstrous demand because of the Cold War and the space race and so on, there was a huge demand for engineers at that time. So much so that if you had a degree in engineering at UC Berkeley, you did not have to look for a job. They came looking for you. And um, there were some recruiting people on Sproul Plaza at UC Berkeley from RCA in Camden who were looking for electrical engineers. And my dad walked by the table and said, well, I'm an electrical engineer. Okay. Do you want a job? Yeah. And coincidentally, a job about as far away from his parents as he could get. Camden, New Jersey. Not a coincidental choice on his part. No. Then he starts the typical suburban, late 20th century, married with kids, absolutely normal life. Except that he is my grandmother's son, and the itch to fight the good fight is a little hard to give up. Now, he met your mom after he moved to New Jersey? Yep. All right, so they start a family, get the suburban house with the mortgage and the lawn and all that. Right. But what do you mean about giving up the good fight? Well, the early ideas about Aegis involved too many, too much weight, too many generators, too much equipment for them to build the size of ship that they wanted to build. And my dad thought about it and decided that if they could get down to one or two generators running one kind of power and they could solve the problem of power conversion, they could make the ship that they were looking to make. The conventional thinking at the time was there's no way. You can't convert these kinds of power. They're incompatible. Well, he didn't think they were, and he sat down with his tools and figured out a way. So there's a piece of classified technology in first-generation Aegis ships that is my dad's. And what it does is convert power from one electrical source to what is needed by the ship, including the weapons and radar systems, the captain's, electric razor, and so on. This is connected in some way to the fact that you can plug a power adapter for an iBook into any outlet anywhere in the world, and it works. Ah, pretty impressive. Yes. So, now, how does this tie to fighting the good fight? He went against the grain. He told the Navy and RCA, I can do this. And they told him it's never been done before. It can't be done. Shut up and be quiet. Well, you don't tell someone in my family, shut up and be quiet, because that's just a reason to start really screaming louder. Auntie Dem will tell you, if you comment on my blog and tell me that I am stupid, you're going to get yelled at. Just because I like the fight. All right, so um, you are, wait, which in line? Number one, number two? I'm firstborn. There's a trend here. <laughs> yeah, there certainly seems to be. So... Were, were you the Hellion in high school, or did that happen later? I was very much the mid, mid-century suburban Hellion. I wasn't the Hellion that my granddad was. I wasn't the Hellion that my grandma was. But it definitely was an annoyance to my parents. So you showed some early signs. Yes, sir. So how did you get it in your head that when you graduated high school, you were going to get out to California and make your way? I burned all my bridges. Ah, so how old were you when you did that? 19. 19, okay. 
So you get to California with a few bucks in your pocket and your grandma's address. And I think she's this loving, round, adorable fuzzball of a woman who's going to hug and kiss me and make me feel better. Because your dad basically sanitized the story. Pretty much. (laughs) And when you actually get there, you find? No. She essentially said to me, I raised your dad. I raised that boy. Do you really think his values and my values are going to be all that different? Well, good point. So you got the idea pretty quick that you were going to have to get a job. Six of them. Six of them. Okay, well... In a year. (laughs) One right after the next? Kinda. (laughs) So you end up at Taxi Unlimited. At 25. I've got the calendar wrong. I was looking at it. Which is pretty much half pirate ship, half home for wayward boys. Yeah. (laughs) Now, for those of you who didn't read my wonderful article about Psycho Dish last year, Taxi Unlimited was one of the communally run businesses that was set up in Berkeley during the hippie era. Yes, we're going to have Utopia and it'll work. Of which there is now only one still left in business, the cheese board. Yes, and they've had to adapt. So they are a cheese shop and now a pizzeria. Right. That is on the gourmet ghetto on the side of Shattuck, north of University in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. You should go there, it's good. So who founded Taxi Unlimited, and what was the basic idea? It was founded by one of the members of the free speech movement in Berkeley who thought that instead of just shutting down Telegraph Avenue and yelling at the cops, we ought to actually start a business that embodies the values that we keep talking about in all these hours and hours long drunken meetings about how the world is going to be better if they just put us in charge. But hippies, though they were, these were still fairly responsible people who had come out to Berkeley for college, who had high IQs and low time preferences. Right, right. They were members of the Berkeley Co-op. They were familiar with the um, free speech riots and so on, but they were still graduates of UC Berkeley and so on. And had come from typical 50s American households. Right. Even if they'd eventually rejected them. Yes. And you started there what year? 1981. By which time things were a little different. By which time it was dominated by drug addicts and drug dealers and their coterie of hangers-on. Which is not particularly surprising that it degenerated into that. No, because the boomers along with trying to create a perfect world, had a bit of a problem with addiction. And, of course, the problem also at Taxi Unlimited was there was no bosses, so nobody could discipline anyone. No one could fire anyone. True. Which meant you could misbehave as badly as you wanted, and you can't really do anything about it. Even to the point of getting arrested. And there were drivers that were using their taxis, basically, as delivery vehicles for their drug-dealing businesses. The business lost money for over a decade. It was the drug dealers, especially the marijuana dealers, that funded it because it was essentially a courier service. So you come into this and it's sort of chugging along, trailing smoke, trailing bolts. Yes, trailing marijuana smoke, yes. But they'll actually give you a job. So Right. So what did you, uh, what did you learn in cab driving? Underneath the left and all of this signaling about social justice and about we have to make it fair is good old American and Yankee self-reliance, build it yourself, do it yourself, run it yourself, own your crap, be accountable, and uh, straighten up and fly right to borrow a lyric. Well, that's when it's working right. But there are people who come in, take advantage of the system, like the drug dealers that were driving cabs at Taxi Unlimited. There are, and there are the mentally ill and the generally just conflicted who are looking for a place where they can be different and be accepted. Taxi Unlimited was that place, but it needed a level of competence in order to function. And 
when you're dealing with an addict, you're dealing with two people. You're dealing with the drug addiction and the person. And the drug addiction is a demon that will eat the person if it isn't cured. And it will eat everything around that person, including their job, their the friends, everything. It is a hungry maw that chews up and spits out bodies, including businesses and so on. And this is what happened to Taxi Unlimited. Everybody there was dysfunctional in some way or another. Um, everybody, not in that fun way like that TV show about driving a taxi. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, arrest and go to jail dysfunctional. And that's what killed it. But someone I knew said on Twitter that the problem with classical liberalism, with the Enlightenment, was that it grants license to professional civilization wreckers and has no means by which to purge them. That kind of sounds a little like Taxi Unlimited, which is it let troubled people in the door and had no means by which to kick them out. Right. Turns out it's kind of a profession to let troubled people in the door and try to get them to be not troubled people. That sounds like all of leftism. Right. As long as the fringe remains at the edges of the bell curve, we're good. It's when they start to creep into the majority and become the dominant force in the bell curve that they tend to become the inmates running the asylum and make a mess of things for the rest of us. See, what I've long said about libertarianism, and I think it's true also of like an anarchism, is... If you took me to a desert island and you just stranded me there with every libertarian I've ever known, even any serious anarchist I've known, you know, not just the type that wants to smoke weed on the street, I mean, people who really understand the theory behind it, and you were to say, okay, you guys live by those principles, it would work out fine because the people I know who advocate that are the type of people who can handle it. With Taxi Unlimited, you start out with this group of people who can handle that kind of system, they move on to go do something else, and you end up with people who can't handle it, and things end up falling apart. Yes. When you don't have traditional management, when you say that everybody has an equal voice, everybody's dysfunction is that much more exposed, is that much more visible. So a year goes by before they start trying to fix this by bringing in the accountant. No, she was there when I got there. Oh, okay. All right. So that's Jenny, who is the... So, how would you describe her? Jenny was a veteran of the free speech movement. She was, she she was an actual hippie, um, an actual free loving woman, who by this point had started going to twelve step meetings and and had put herself through San Francisco State with a degree in business and realized that the um, free love, free food kind of anarchist, we'll just do whatever thing didn't work. That she actually needed structure in her life. She needed uh, recovery programs. She needed a degree in, in understanding of how to run a business. And she was brought to Tax and Limited by the drug dealers because they were getting really pissed off that their customers were running their cab company. And if she didn't know that she needed structure before Taxi Unlimited, she sure knew after it. Oh, heck yeah. So she comes in, and I believe it was pretty much the first month she was there, she realized that nobody had paid Taxi Unlimited's insurance bill in months. Or rent, or the mechanic, or anything that you... The city of Berkeley, the taxi permits, pretty much all the bills necessary to a cab company. So she starts paying the bills... And pisses everybody off. Because now their checks are light. Yes. So this basically ends up in a peasant revolt. Pretty much. There's also some um, behavior towards her that was inappropriate even by 80s standards. Well, yeah, she's a heavy chick. So why wouldn't she give a BJ to the drivers? And they insisted and she politely refused? Well, she's Jenny, so I'm not sure it was polite. <laughs> And how long did she last? She became a force to be reckoned with. This is the thing you got to realize. Women that survived the 60s, that survived all that free love and anarchy and so on, gained a strength of character that served them well later in their lives. And someone like Ginny, who was a veteran of 
San Francisco State and the riots in San Francisco State and a veteran of the free speech movement and actually met, had actually met Mario Savio when some pot smoking child of a hippie shows up at Taxi Unlimited and says, you supposed to, it took her about 30 seconds to shut him down because she was friends with their father and had been there at all the places you want to think about, Woodstock and Berkeley and the free speech riots. So when they, these kids in the 80s tried to come to her and say, well, I'm a hippie and I know, she's like, no, you're not. No, you are not. I'm a hippie and this is how this is going to go. So how long did she last at Taxi Unlimited? She lasted about a year and a half, two years until it just became overwhelming. Um, there were too many peasants revolting. And how long did you last there? About as long. So you ended up at some point living underneath the porch or? Within three months, yeah, of starting there. So it, it sounds pretty chaotic. Give us an idea of like just sort of a picture of what it was like. Who was there? What, what did it look like? What were the, the sights and sounds and feels? Well, day to day, it actually ran as a cab company. So there was a dispatcher there who was taking calls and, and, and trying to get drivers to fill calls. There was a mechanic who was always working on the cars. There was Jenny who was in there two, three days a week to come in and do the books. So it did run as a business. And most of the work day stuff in cab driving is kind of like police work. 99% of the time, boring as hell. You sit on your ass and you wait for the radio to send you to go pick up a customer. You go pick up the customer. You get paid. You put them out. Life goes on. It, the the TV show and the stories you hear from cab drivers are the 2 or 3% of the time when you get somebody like Mary Garst or, or the hate man or any of, any of Berkeley's eccentrics. Wait, the hate man? Yes. So tell me about the hate man. So, I don't know if he's still alive, but the hate man is a Berkeley eccentric who, his shtick, his thing is, if you tell him, I love you, hate man, he'll curse you out. If you say, I hate you, hate man, he says, thank you. So, he's just a contrarian. He's just a gadfly. Pretty much. And what were some examples of this? I stood behind him in line at the old Berkeley Food Co-op credit union, and that particular day, he had on a... Uh, jeans jacket, a men's jeans jacket, a bra, panties, a skirt, tights, because there weren't leggings at that point. So there, there was this mishmash of men's and women's clothing together, and he was making a deposit at the bank. Just to piss people. He wasn't like a transgender individual. No, he was just doing it to piss people just off. Just doing it, yeah. Yeah, no, he was trying to get a reaction. Now let's talk a little bit about Mary. Yes. Poor little rich girl. Poor little rich girl. So she had... Did she still have a license by the time he met her, or was that one too many? No, that lives? was one too many. She she was on a first-name basis with the police, and they pretty much told her, if we catch you behind the wheel of a car, we're keeping you. Forever. Yes. So she became a regular customer of Taxi Unlimited. Um, I think Taxi Unlimited was actually crazier than Mary, and she, Mary needed professional cab drivers who would actually do their job and not pot-smoking hippie wannabes who had romantic ideas about a more perfect world. So tell us some of the stories about her and the the antics that you witnessed. So the one that everybody likes to hear about is the time that she told me to go into the Berkeley Hills to a prominent Berkeley, UC Berkeley professor, to his house. The guy had a pecan tree in his front yard we had already gone to Berkeley Harbor and purchased an axe, and Mary was going to give me $1,000 if I would cut down this man's tree on George Washington's birthday. Did you do it? No. Her plan B was to spend $300 taking her around San Francisco, which I was fine with. And you did that? Oh, yeah. So what was the craziest cab ride you ever gave? The cocaine-fueled, paranoid, schizophrenic, who swore that the black helicopters overhead were following him in particular and that he had to escape in a taxi to get away from them. Where'd you take him? 
Walnut Creek, San Francisco, San Jose, Mar uh, Marin County somewhere. Do you pay up? Oh, yeah. So a good night for you. Excellent night for me. So what did you do after cab driving? Oh. Well, first things first. When did you discover computers? Because you kind of developed a passion for them. I was one of those fanboys who, in 1984, when the Apple Macintosh commercial came out, swore up and down one day, somehow, some way, I'm going to own one of these things. All right, so you got inspired, and, but you didn't get into them really right away? No. I bounced around Laney College with Anita Black and the basically the typing school that was still at Laney College. And then transferred and... And thought I was going to be a math major and tanked. And then got into the English department. And you graduated with an English degree? Yes. So it was there that you met the Empress. I met the Empress. <laughs> and um, you, you developed something of a fascination with Asian culture. Yeah. All right. Now, she takes you to Taiwan. After getting married, yeah. Okay. So tell us what you thought of Taiwan. The night markets in Taiwan are definitely something you want to go see. I highly recommend not going to the night market that the concierge at the hotel will tell you to go to. But go find the down and dirty, small alley, crowded, kind of scary looking alley starting about 6 o'clock at night running till midnight. Because that's where the locals are. That's where nobody speaks English. You're going to have an extraordinary fish out of water experience. Because you can't communicate. But you're going to have a great time. Taiwanese people are wonderful. So what did you think of the city of Taipei itself? I mean... It's, it's frantic. Well, that's the other thing. The, the pace, the energy of Asia. Americans are slow compared to the Chinese. We move too slow. We think too slow. The Chinese think of us as stupid. And I, I've never been to Japan, but I did have that similar sort of I'm never going to be accepted as one of these people. I'll be accepted as a guest, but it is one of those countries where they're very happy to be hospitable until your credit card runs out. There was someone who mentioned to me his opinion that uh, Chinese women have cash registers for souls. Yeah, I would agree with that. But then, of course, you end up having number one son. Yes, the prince. And uh, he has just left you after a visit of how long? He was here for four days. All right, and he is how old now? Twenty. And he is in line to be the respectable normal generation. We hope. Well, how much of a hellion is he now? Well, all right. So, like many millennials... His public face is of somebody who doesn't give a rip and who's quite happy spending 14 hours a day a lump on the couch playing Pokemon. But in private? He has a job at Panera so he can play Pokemon. Well, that does leave you with the free time to do that. The length of his ambition at this point in life is to be an... Pokemon master? A Pokemon master... And an associate trainer, because apparently at the level of an associate trainer, he can afford his Pokemon habit. So some people say you've got to live to work instead of work to live. He basically works to Pokemon? Right. He works to Pokemon. Does he have any ambitions beyond Pokemon for the future? Oh, whichever girl passed by his gaze lately. And play Pokemon with her? Yeah. Well, all quite honorable, I'm sure. Naked Pokemon, it's a, it's a thing. So you ended up with this house that we are in right now. After many years and a divorce, and yeah. Uh, now, you have had some experiences with homelessness in your day. I have, more than once. So, Psycho Dish, tell us what it's like to be homeless. Sucks. Could you expand on that a bit? <laughs> Everything becomes expensive... Time becomes expensive. It takes an extraordinary amount of time to accomplish anything. Things that take five, ten minutes on the internet become two and four hour epic tasks because you've got to get on a bus, you've got to go to a public or a government building, 
you've got to talk to some uh, civil service worker. And all of this means that it's a couple hours on the bus to get to the civil service worker. It's a couple hours waiting to see the civil service worker who spends five minutes with you to turn you loose. And now you have to spend two hours getting back to where you were going. Everything is expensive in terms of resources. Just simply getting a meal means you've got to burn all this time to stand in line, to register, to prove that, yes, you really are broke. And they really should give you a meal. There's all this process. Anybody who's keeping a job, and, and, and me lately, because I have a car and I have a house and so on, um, I can go to Kroger and I can get whatever I need in a few minutes. If you're homeless, it's kind of epic. You know, uh, can I get a burrito? Well, let's see. Um, do you have bus fare to get to the burrito place? No. You have to beg for it. Uh, okay, so now you beg for the burrito money. Do you have bus fare to get back to the shelter? No. Well, crap. Oh, wait. If you're not back at the shelter by 4 o'clock, you're not going to be in the shelter tonight. So I guess you're going to sleep on the street after having eaten a burrito. So tell us what the clientele of a homeless shelter is like. It's a lot of mentally ill, a lot of addicts. It's a lot of people that we are underserving and the only place for them to get any little bit of services is some NGO or nonprofit that is doing a shelter program. But unless anyone think you too much of a bleeding heart, I think that it's probably these experiences that turned you a little bit more rightward. Yes, because rather than, and this happened in my 20s, and this is what moved me to get involved in Tax Unlimited, Rather than take the SSDI, the, the, the psych disability check that I was offered in my 20s, I made a choice a long time ago to keep a job because I realized if I took that SSDI check, I was going to be holding to a pimp daddy named Uncle Sam and I was going to have to do whatever he wanted for the rest of my life and have no say in how my life went except where he decided to throw me a little bit of a perk here and there. But there's a lot of people who are uh, Big Daddy government's hoes. Yes, and they are giving BJs to Uncle Sam. And it, it's basically a slave plantation where you've got one day a year of work, which is election day. Right. Right. And I opted out. And it is why I went to Tax and Loaded. It is why I got an English degree. It is why when the Empress said, you need to get a job, I went and got a job. I... I my family history and, and our parallel history with mental health, I can easily qualify for SSDI if I want it. But I've chosen for many decades now to turn it down. Am I miserable because of that? Yeah. But I, this is a misery I chose. And it is a misery that gives me a degree of freedom that is not available to somebody who stuck Uncle Sam's dick in their mouth. So how did you get the nickname Psycho Dish? Roger at Rich Brow, which is a defunct uh, brew pub on East Cary Street in Richmond, Virginia, that made their own that made their own very terrible beer. Roger was surprised that the dishwasher in his restaurant was smart, crazy, and knew something about computers. He could not figure out how it's possible for an intelligent, college-educated white man to land a, at a dishwashing job in a dive like Rich Brown. So he named you Psycho Dish. Because I was crazy. Now there are some who might say, and I'm not saying I'm among them, that the only two jobs that you've really been really, really, really good at have been cab driving and washing dishes. Still true. So you have driven for Uber of late? Yes. So I take it Uber is a better run operation than Taxi Unlimited? By a lot, yes. But Uber is the same sort of anarchistic and dot-com cultured disruptive corporation that is, I think, our country's future. The gig economy, they call it. Yeah, much to the frustration of the labor unions and the left. Now, aside from cab driving, you are an oft-employed and oft-fired IT professional. Currently hired, but we'll see how long that lasts. 
So how does the hired to fired cycle normally work with you? I get hired as a temp. I have an uncontrollable itch to fight the good fight and fight it and get told that I won't be continued beyond the end of my contract. Ow. Yeah. So you also drove the map car. That was last summer, yes. We started in New Hampshire. You people on the intertubes that hear this, if you're interested, you can go look at Microsoft.com, Bing Maps, and the street side view pictures that you're looking at were photographed by cars that I and my teammates drove. That sounds like a pretty good job, actually. It was a very good job. So what do you have planned for the future? I'm getting back on my feet through this job. I built a website where I'm able to demonstrate the Yes I Can program uh, in PHP and MySQL. Although it's really shitty code, please don't look too closely at it. Anybody who's any good at programming will tell me all the things that I already know, thank you, about what's wrong with it. But that was a demonstrator site that I put out there so I could show potential customers Yes, in fact, I can marry PHP and SQL. So are you going to get out of the ghetto? Not immediately. It happened backwards. I was in strongly encouraged and offered money to move out of the hotel I was living in. So I did. And then when I got here, I realized that there's some missions work that could possibly happen. Of course, once I've gotten here, I realized that my own work to do in terms of getting myself together... I'm, my, I'm, I'm enough of a project by myself. And trying to fix somebody else is probably not where I need to put my energy. Uh, the other thing I've discovered, in, and I heard this pretty clearly in church this morning, what God wants out of me is more blog posts, more writing, more commentary on some of the absurdities of this first world life we live. And we are going to get to that in the next chapter of this uh, interview. All righty then. But before we go, let's, let's talk about what I wrote my last blog post about you about, which is the murder around here had to be about a month ago now, maybe yeah. two months ago. Yeah. So what, what was that all about? I came home to find the cops here and my street blocked off. I couldn't park in front of my house. Usually the street that I turned down to get onto my alley is available to me this particular day, it was closed off. I could not go home to my backyard down the alley this way. I had to go around the block and get at my house a different way. The reason was I found out that a neighbor's grandson had been murdered, not shot. We initially thought shot, but not shot. And the police were here investigating. So if he wasn't shot, what happened to him? Police have not told us. But he did have some holes in him that got there somehow. He did have some wounds in him that killed him, yes. Well, that's pretty depressing. Yeah, but this is where community involvement, where walking out your front door and knocking on your neighbor's door, finding opportunities to serve is going to make a difference. Not so much... And Berkeley's famous for this, punching some cops in the face. Speaking of which, we are going to get to that in our next episode, soon to be recorded, because you got some stuff to say about Black Lives Matter and highways being shut down and all of that kind of stuff. Yes, sir. So after a short break, we will reconvene. We will talk to you about that. For our uh, subscribers, that will be the very next podcast in this series. Good to talk to you. So we will get to you then and uh, talk to you next time. <laughs>